Welcome to Sex Care is Self Care, a conversation on women's sexual health. Today I'm joined by members of our PBF Medical Board to discuss something very interesting. Are you guys ready? The fourth trimester. Hello everyone, let's take a moment to get introduced. Um, so let's tell them a little bit about yourselves. Dr. Vaccaro, you wanna start? Yes, thanks Patty, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Dr. Christine Vaccaro and I'm fellowship trained and double board certified in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery as well as obstetrics and gynecology. I'm also the fellowship director for female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery and an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Iglesia. Hi, I'm Dr. Shirelle Iglesia. Um, I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and neurology at Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. I'm also double board certified and um, a, uh, the director of the National Center for Advanced Public Surgery for MedStar Health, also here in Washington. Happy to be here, Patty. Dr. Novicki. And I am um, Kathleen Novicki. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and a board certified pelvic health rehabilitation professional. Um, I was the pioneer of pelvic health physical therapy in the greater Cincinnati area and now are, is the director of education and pelvic floor program development at Oxford Physical Therapy. Glad to be here too. <laughs> so excited. I'm going to tell you, I'm excited with this whole topic. So let's go ahead. Let's get started. Uh, Dr. Iglesias, what exactly does this fourth trimester mean? Can you explain it a little bit? Well, you know, we have the nine months of pregnancies, the three trimesters, and we realized we as healthcare professionals are missing out on the fourth trimester, which are the 12 weeks after you deliver, after the baby is born, which is generally a joyous time, but it is a time that you're taking care of a new individual as well as trying to take care of yourself and we as healthcare professionals need to check in. Before we used to just say, okay, congratulations, here's your baby and we'll see you at the six week visit. We realize that there's a lot more going on. I mean, a lot of times people will want to follow up with conditions with pregnancy themselves. They may have had a traumatic delivery. They may be at risk related to chronic conditions where we need to check in on their on their uh, blood pressure and some other hype, uh, uh, diabetes and whatnot. But I think that we also need to check in psychologically as well as physically um, with regards to screening and trying to address things before they become a problem uh, related to sort of mental health. Um, you know, people get the postpartum blues, but that can fall into a, a real postpartum depression which, if, which if, if caught early is a lot easier to treat. Secondly, there's a lot of physiological changes that have happened, um, not just to the vagina uh, and the vulva, um, but just hormonally as well. So I think we're gonna delve into some of the issues as to why the fourth trimester has become a thing, because we can't just um, say, tell women to go on and, have that baby go ahead and breastfeed and not think you're gonna have any issues. You're tired, you're sore, the, the breastfeeding may not be coming in. There's a lot of hormonal changes. You're taking care, it's, it's, it could have been traumatic. There's a lot to talk about and we need to check in early and often, as early as three to 10 days and you know up, up through the 12 weeks after delivery. So the whole fourth trimester is a big deal. Patty. Uh, I, I love this because I think this has been a subject that's been very neglected and I'm glad we're bringing it to the forefront. So the fourth tra uh, trimester is a transition phase for you know physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, what are some of the most common issues that new mothers face? Uh, Dr. Vaccaro, you want to start? Thanks, Patty. Yes. And, you know, as a mother myself, I can attest that this is a very stressful time on the mind and body. Throw in a little sleep deprivation. And what I mean is a lot of sleep deprivation. And it's a wonder we even survived the fourth trimester at all or choose to do it again. 
Um, but just as Dr. Iglesia pointed out, you know, the, the first 12 weeks after delivery, this fourth trimester, the body is healing uh, physically from birth trauma. There's always some, even if it's just a little, um, and that can be vaginal tearing or even multiple different um, tissue layers to heal if it was through a cesarean section. The uterus is shrinking back to its normal size. Um, during this time, it's common to have a lot of irregular vaginal bleeding. Um, it can be light, it can be moderate, and sometimes heavy at times. Um, if it's anything ever heavier than a pad an hour over two consecutive hours, that should prompt urgent medical evaluation. But because of the bleeding and all the healing that's occurring and the sleep deprivation, many moms feel really weak and tired. Um, and this is just a very stressful time physically for them. And then let's throw in, you know, body image and weight, um, which just adds to the problem for some patients. Um, so if you are lucky enough to only gain the recommended amount, which is 25 to 35 pounds during your pregnancy, and that's if you're a normal weight going into pregnancy, um, you're in luck because you've just lost some. So with delivery, the, the baby, the placenta and fluids, you lose about 10 to 15 pounds, but that still leaves, still leaves an extra um, amount of pounds there, 15 to 20 pounds for most women. Um, breastfeeding can help shed the pounds. Um, it's a great also form of bonding between the mom and baby and the healthiest form of nutrition. But that physical act of needing to be close to your baby and feeding every two to three hours around the clock takes quite a toll as well, again, on the sleep deprivation. Um, and then I'm just gonna go back to, you know, the pelvic floor and the vagina, which are starting to heal. And this is a, a process called remodeling. And I mean, I, I still am just overwhelmed at the um, remarkable process of a vaginal birth. So literally the vagina, which is the birth canal, stretches to allow passage of the fetal head that's about 10 centimeters wide. And then it returns back to near normal a few months later. I mean, I think this is actually really amazing and doesn't get much, you know, we don't talk about this much either, but it's just quite a remarkable organ to be able to do that. Um, but because of all this change in the vagina, the soonest a mom should return to normal sexual activity at all is, is six to eight weeks after vaginal delivery. And that's the absolute soonest. A lot of women need more like 12 weeks, meaning at the end of the fourth trimester. And women that are breastfeeding, the vagina is low in estrogen and makes less natural lubrication. This can lead to vaginal dryness and discomfort with sex. Um, women that are exclusively breastfeeding may not have a period for more than six months following delivery. So these are just some of the other hormonal changes. Um, so this no period and vaginal dryness are basically nature's way of preventing another pregnancy. So this is not 100% though. So some pregnancies can occur within that time period, which is why it's so important and critical for women to get a good form of birth control on discharge from the hospital because we know, which we'll talk about later, some women don't follow up and then can have that closely spaced interval pregnancy. Um, to shift gears to the mental component, again, most moms are what I call, they're in survival mode. It's keep the baby alive. And if you have other kids, keep them alive too. But that is, that is the sole focus. And the mom's brain is really hardwired just to nurture and, and keep, keep the baby going. Um, Due to extreme, again, sleep deprivation, most moms struggle with brain fog. If they have to go back to work, luckily, most women are protected at least for this initial fourth trimester or the 12 weeks following delivery by the Family Medical Leave Act or FMLA. But this sometimes, just this time frame, sometimes isn't completely adequate. Um, and then emotionally, again, as uh, Dr. Glacia uh, spoke on, this this postpartum depression is is quite common. So baby blues are the most common. So that's 80% of women will have a brief period of increased sadness or crying or emotional volatility. Um, and this can be for many reasons, but our partner may have gone back to work. She might feel isolated, sad, depressed, maybe not have adequate social support. And even with her husband there and great social support, the baby blues can, can still happen. Um, there are several support groups available for breastfeeding moms, new moms, um, but some moms don't either know where to ask or where to look for the motive, where to look for the resources, or, or if they are in clinical depression, lack the motivation to help themselves. So postpartum depression that is clinically diagnosed can occur up to 20% of moms, um, and this requires treatment. Um, of these women, a very rare and severe form of mental illness can occur called postpartum psychosis, 
And this can occur in one to two per 1,000 women um, that have postpartum depression. So again, just like Dr. Glaze is saying, it's, it's so critical for these women to, to check in um, frequently. So again, during the, the postpartum visit, she's asked about these things. Are you experiencing baby blues, depression, thoughts of harming yourself or the baby to screen for these conditions? Um, and I know this all sounds sort of doom and gloom, but um, to finish off on a high point, most moms really rejoice in this time and um, their ability to nurture their baby. Um, and they survive this physically, mentally, emotionally challenging time um, of the fourth trimester and, and usually go on to do it again. So. Well, as everyone can see, there's a lot of moving components about this fourth trimester. So we have uh, we do have a lot to cover. And I'm so glad I have the best of the best here. Um, to answer some of these questions. Okay, Dr. Novicki, is it, is it important for a woman uh, having a baby to have a pelvic floor physical therapist in place uh, before she has this, before she gives birth? Um, absolutely, I highly recommend it. Um, as, as we just heard, um, that fourth trimester um, is quite, um, um, involved with taking care of the baby, taking care of yourself, taking care of your other family members. Um, so the more information you have prior to delivery, the, the, the more knowledge and the ability to help yourself um, post-delivery. Um, if you go to see a pelvic floor physical therapist um, prior to delivery, um, they'll instruct you in a number of things that you can do yourself to help you with recovery. Um, we'll show you um, the proper application of ice and heat, how to use a sitz bath, um, whether or not a belly band might be useful for support. Um, we would um, show you um, self massage techniques that would help to restore that um, any scar tissue that might occur um, to have it become flexible and less painful. Um, we'll show you techniques that you can do to reduce any muscle spasm and pain in that area. Um, we even um, teach you um, breathing and meditation techniques that can help you to reduce your stress levels, allow you to fall asleep faster because you've got to sleep in between those breastfeeding times. <laughs> um, we'll show you the proper way to um, position yourself so that you're not straining your neck and your back when you're breastfeeding. Um, and also um, appropriate exercise. You know, you don't want to immediately after delivery jump into Kegel exercises. Um, there are appropriate exercises that facilitate circulation, reduce swelling, um, speed up your healing and yet can be done while you're breastfeeding. Um, so it's not something that you have to take time out um, and add to your already busy day, um, but you can do that to help yourself um, feel better. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, your, your pelvic floor and your core becomes weakened um, and yet you have a, um, an ever-growing um, baby that you're lifting and you're moving around. Um, so we teach you how to protect your pelvic floor and your core by properly showing you how to lift, how to get that baby in and out of a car seat, how to um, you know, take it off the changing table, how to place it, your baby in and out of the crib um, so that your pelvic floor and your core do doesn't get excessively strained while it is in its weakened condition. Where were you when I had my four children? I mean, I think everybody needs to have a physical therapist available to them. I think this is great information and great support for a woman who's just having a baby for the fifth, first, second, third, fourth time. Um, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit something before the next question comes up. I breastfed all of my children. I breastfed because I was living in an area where I did not have support. Um, but I did have friends that were in the medical field and told me that I needed to do it. I was glad that I did. Um, but I know that I was really worried at times thinking, oh my gosh, are they getting enough? Or am I doing it the right way? Um, so breastfeeding can be very, it can be uh, it, very challenging. Uh, where are some of the areas that resources that you can go to that will help with this? Dr. Inglesia, can you help us with that? Right. 
You know that, Patty, uh, there are actually certified lactation consultants. Many work at, at uh, hospitals or with um, midwife groups. And um, there's actually an international board of certified lactation consultants. So this is a big deal because you're not alone. I too had issues because also because my child, um, both of them were premature and the milk wasn't coming in. So I, I think that obviously um, it's the best for the patient, uh, for the baby. You're not only giving milk and nutrition, there's all of these other, other um, fluids that the baby needs to prevent allergies, to thrive, you need it for the bonding. And sometimes you can't do it, the baby doesn't latch on, you develop a mastitis, it hurts so much, you have inverted nipples, um, it's just not working out. So it is good to be able to have someone who can actually coach you through this. So in addition to the I IBCLC, the International Board of Certified Lactation Consultants, uh, ACOG, the American College of OBGYN and the American um, College of Nurse Midwives have excellent resources. And then locally, um, I think there are a lot of support groups. You know, you developed your own little um, posse or support group of breastfeeding uh, cheerleaders. Um, but there is like something called the La Leche League. And I think lots of local places in, in the United States um, where you can call and um, be coached um, on how to do this. I think one of the hardest things that for, for me was after having to go back and, you know, at the time there was no FMLA. I mean, we basically, I was actually in training. We had six weeks, right? So I had to go back and um, figure out what to do with my breast milk. <laughs> and we had this humongous pump and there was a handheld one. And it was like, every time I'd come up with like two ounces, my nurses would clap and then where to store them and all the bottles. It's amazing the technology now when I have all my uh, medical students and residents and fellows who are postpartum and breastfeeding have returned to work. And there's all these hand-free devices, clever um, ways of storing the breast milk. I think it's, um, it's, it's come a long way from when you and I started that. <laughs> I think that you're absolutely right. And I remember the Leachy League, I, I had their book. That was my Bible. That was the only thing that I had other than, you know, if I could get a hold of like, like one of my friends in that area, like, and you hate bothering anybody in the medical field because they're busy, but the, you know, it's, yeah. Having that I book wanna, helped me. And I want to say one thing because sometimes it, it you can't breastfeed for, for various and sundry reasons. The milk isn't coming in. There's medical issues. I mean, again, my child was like premature. There's other issues. So, you know, you're going to need to go with the formula and that's very expensive. And, um, you know, so I think that our WIC programs uh, cover a lot of this. And I think, you know, talking to uh, your provider, nurse, white, nurse midwife, OBGYN, um, the lactation consultants themselves will be able to refer you because these formulas are, are kind of expensive. I agree. And I don't think anybody should ever feel bad if they cannot breastfeed. So I'm glad that you, you added that because I have 14 grandchildren and there's, you know, and, and some of their mommies have not been able to breastfeed and it's like, don't feel bad. It's okay. It's all right. Um, during the postpartum period, so many women feel exhausted with low libido. Um, and if they're breastfeeding, they may experience vaginal dryness and painful sex. Is this normal, Dr. Vercaro? Yes, Patty, thanks for the question. So <clears throat> women in the fourth trimester usually have very low or absent sex drive for so many obvious reasons. Number one, they're exhausted again with the sleep deprivation. They're still bleeding. Their vagina is still dry, sore, and healing. They don't like their body image and the extra weight. Their breasts are leaking. Um, they might even have temporary or long-lasting urinary leakage or, or accidental bowel leakage resulting from the delivery. So just to briefly summarize, they're not feeling their sexiest um, and they're exhausted. So they don't really have the energy or desire to engage in sex. Um, and then just hormonally to touch on again, women that are breastfeeding, their bodies are in a low estrogen state. Again, this causes the vaginal dryness, soreness, and irritation. Again, this is a 
normal physiologic response in the fourth trimester in breastfeeding moms. Again, as nature's way of trying to space out pregnancies. Um, so moms can recover from this extremely difficult task of literally growing a human, delivering it to a vaginal or an abdominal, large abdominal incision. So there's a lot of time that a woman needs to really recover from this um, event. So again, it is normal to have um, vaginal dryness, especially during breastfeeding. But in these women, there, there are some women though that either aren't breastfeeding or you know, occasionally have um, enough energy and desire to engage in sex or just wanna feel that closeness with their partner. So again, there's so many reasons why women do engage in sexual activity and one of them is bonding with their partner. Um, so if they just have vaginal dryness alone in absence of significant birth trauma, um, the vaginal dryness can be easily treatable with a personal lubricant or um, a low-dose vaginal estrogen replacement in women that are breastfeeding that want to do that. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Novicki, can a pelvic floor physical therapists help women who are experiencing painful sex during postpartum? Um, yes. Um, you know, um, after... Um, um, you know, utilizing vaginal lubricants, vaginal moisturizers, and yet um, there still is painful sex. It may be an issue where the um, vaginal muscles are in spasm. Um, and a pelvic floor physical therapist would be able to evaluate that and um, do in-clinic treatments as well as show you how to appropriately treat it at home. Um, some in-clinic treatments would be manual therapies um, that are gentle um, and facilitate uh, relaxation of that muscle. Um, we would show you and possibly your partner on how to do these techniques at home. Um, they're very useful, particularly as you progress along um, that um, it can lead into um, spontaneous pleasurable sex. Um, so, um, you know, I encourage if you are experiencing, you know, persistent pain, even with, um, you know, treatment for vaginal dryness, it might be an issue where the muscles are in spasm and, um, not only with manual therapy, but there's, um, exercises that we can show you that, um, are also helpful at, uh, reducing muscle spasm, improving your body's response to lubrication, um, and, being able to enjoy sex again. That that's that is really great information. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know the next topic that we're going to talk about is um, this is sensitive, um, and but I think it's important that we talk about this, and that's postpartum depression. Uh, what is the most important things for our listeners to know, Dr. Inglesia? get treatment. This is uh, serious. And um, we have 4 million deliveries a year, Patty. Um, half of them are unplanned in the United States, but um, probably 3 million have some form of postpartum depression or the blues, as, as um, Dr. Vaccaro was saying. And if you are feeling hopeless, helpless, I mean, the fatigue itself, mm -hmm the sleeplessness, um, the hormonal changes, the physiologic changes and um, pain from either C-sections or vaginal delivery um, and the breastfeeding woes can lead to a lot of issues. So if, the, if you're feeling of hopelessness, the worry, the anxiety, the extreme fatigue persists beyond two weeks, that is not normal. Um, we need to intervene. It's better to intervene early and talk to someone. That's another reason why the fourth trimester was developed so that someone could check in. People who have had a traumatic deliveries, um, more on the unplanned side as well, um, who have less of a support group where the finances are an issue, they're at um, and have baseline depression, anxiety, maybe at high risk for developing postpartum depression. Um, but if you have any feelings of harming yourself or harming another person, we need direct intervention. To be quite honest, we have new medications that can work pretty fast and significant that have been improved, um, approved by the FDA, specific for postpartum depression. But 
if you think someone or you recognize this in someone, we need to call the suicide prevention hotline. You know, there's a 1-800-273-TALK. This is how serious this is because um, it's not a sign of weakness. This is a compendium of things um, that are related to neurotransmitters um, and to your own physiology and the hormonal issues that are going on and taking care of a new human being um, when you feel somewhat inadequate. So I am very passionate about this. Um, I, I myself can remember being very blue. I remember delivering. I was a first year fellow. Um, I, I told my fellow, I told my fellow, I showed up, I showed up to pregnant, I showed up to fellowship all knocked up. And then I just had to leave like the first month of fellowship. So then I, you know, I felt really like anxious. I had to get back, um, to work because I just joined this fellowship and my mother-in-law was with me for a week and my, my mother came and then my husband had to go back to work. And I remember leaving my apartment building, being in the driveway with the stroller saying goodbye to my mother. And then I was looking at me, I was like, it's just you and me, kid. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, so I, I you know, and I'm highly educated and I'm an OBGYN, yet I had those feelings of, of inadequacy. So, you know, check in. And I think it's important to have a good support group because it's a very, very important topic. I think, yeah. I love that you're saying this because, you know, again, I think everybody has to have that support group, but sometimes you have to be your own best advocate, correct? Meaning, yeah. before you have this but child. It's hard when you're feeling that, that, and you're sore, your bottom sore, your C-section scar is sore. It's really hard. That's why, you know, I think it's also important for providers. You know, in Europe, after the, they have people coming to your house. <laughs> we need to advance ourselves to understand that, um, trying to get us back right away. We need to come back when we're healed and strong. And we also need to focus on, on raising healthy children too, you know, and, and prioritize what's going on in these early child, uh, early infant and childhood years. I, don't I, don't I agree. The, I'm, I'm, going off, I'm going on a tangent. No, <laughs> I, no, I love the tangent because I, I could be there with you. Um, yes. But I'm just going to go back really quick here and say, maybe before she gives birth that she has maybe two good friends or two people that she really trusts that will call her and check in every so often and that she has this promise made this promise to them and to herself that if there is a problem that they will help her through this uh, because I have witnessed it in my own family and sometimes it's like is she okay is she not okay and I've had to step in and say you're not okay Let's, let's get absolutely. some help and don't feel we, ashamed, you know? Absolutely. So, okay. The stigma holds us back, but this is, could be a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. You're right. And it's, it, it's scary because they, you know, sometimes you don't want to admit that there is a problem because sometimes they, in my case, I witnessed that they felt like they were weak or they were not doing uh, what they were supposed to be doing and that wasn't the case at all and so um, I think having people that are strong and to be able to support you through this I think that's important so girls rally your team before you give birth um, according to ACOG 50% of pregnancy related deaths occur after the baby is born currently up to 40% of new mothers do not which this blew me away, return for postpartum care. Some of the reasons might be they're in abusive situations. Uh, maybe it's transportation issues. Um, maybe it's substance abuse. Um, can women who face even more significant challenges re receive the, re the support that they need to make it through this crucial time? Um, Dr. Vaccaro. Yeah, Patty, this is such a truly challenging um, situation. You know, we have we have social programs for these patients, um, and they need specific resources and a really sharp healthcare team to identify them early on and connect them with the right and appropriate social services in their area. But again, a lot of this doesn't doesn't happen. Um, again, in their inability to return for their postpartum visit, really does impact their health. Um, regarding intimate um, 
uh, partner violence, it is standard to discuss this at their first obstetric new patient visit. Um, and it's also standard upon admission for delivery with the partner not in the room, which is really critical. So, um, you know, it's hard, obviously, for a patient to admit that with a partner in the room. So a lot of times the partner will be asked to step out to ask those questions. Um, and we also ask it at the postpartum visit. However, again, just like you're alluding to, sometimes they don't show up for that. Despite us asking them, they may not truthfully answer due to fear of retaliation from their partner. Um, so we have to, again, be really astute. We have to look for red flags, um, either physical abuse, meaning bruising that's um, characteristic of abuse, as well as if when they do come for their obstetric visits and their partner does come with them, if the partner is talking over them, not allowing them to talk, basically controlling all their behaviors, that's another red flag. So again, it takes a really astute team. It takes um, us asking the right questions with the partner not in the room. And then as you mentioned, transportation, this can be another significant barrier um, to, to whether a mom can come back for her follow-up appointments. Sometimes it's just a really long distance, um, you know, the, the cost of, of getting there, either public or um, transportation or gas in the tank. Um, and then potentially no transportation options if they just have one car and, and the husband went, took the car to work and then she doesn't have a car. So there's a lot of, a lot of issues with transportation. Um, and, and sadly, women that miss these appointments sometimes can be labeled as non-compliant with their healthcare when in reality, it's just they don't have the resources to get to the appointment. And again, this is um, especially concerning for women in poverty. So again, getting social work involved um, they can help with transportation assistance to get these patients in for their care. And then lastly, you mentioned sub, you know, substance abuse. Um, and this is particularly tricky because despite any management, either inpatient or outpatient management during their pregnancy, they're still at high risk for not returning to their visits. Um, they may not resume any form of birth control. They may return to substance abuse because again, this, as we've just discussed, is a very significantly stressful time in a woman's life. Um, so again, just like Dr. Glacier was saying, we need to just really be on top of these patients and clear, encourage close outpatient follow-up um, and make sure that they have the resources that they need. Yeah, because I think if they're in, um, if they're having these significant challenges, it seems to me like it does fall back on the medical field to be able to see to it that these people receive the help that they need. Um, because I, I know that you're not mind readers, none of you are, and you're, you um, are, it's very hard, but I think that there has to be a system within our own medical world to make sure that every patient gets the care that they deserve. Uh, another group of postpartum mothers are, um, that aren't discussed in our culture, women who experience stillbirth, and neonatal deaths. Dr. Inglacius, what, what do we need to know about these women? This is a really, uh, really astute question because I don't think it gets asked a lot, Patty. And gosh, these women are devastated. I mean, particularly if it's something past the third trimester where you've even had a baby shower, you've had a name, you may have a nursery all, all picked out and ready. And then no baby came home. Um, this group of women need a lot of emotional support. And fortunately, a lot of hospitals and birthing centers have bereavement counselors who are just focused on that. There are a lot of um, therapists who are just focused on women's health and uh, health around contraception, I mean, um, conception. Um, so women who actually have a lot of fertility and also who have losses. They're gonna need a lot of time to heal and they have a lot of questions. So the fourth trimester is important for this women because they have so many questions. They wanna look at those labs. They wanna look at the pathology. What went wrong? They, have, they wanna know about the genetics. And I think foremost um, in their minds is, how do I prevent this from happening again? Um, was it, and the guilt, was it something that I did? Is there something that I, I shouldn't have 
I shouldn't have smoked. I shouldn't have, uh, well, you shouldn't smoke during pregnancy anyway. <laughs> I use a better example. I should have eaten that food. I shouldn't have had sex. I shouldn't have done this. Um, I have to say 25% of pregnancies end up in miscarriage. I myself had two and I had one as a, at 17 weeks, um, pretty far along. And I, my husband and I were both very devastated because it was something that um, obviously we had a, another child and things turned out, but we had already named that child. We had already, you know, and so I think you need to understand some people may need um, some type of spiritual counseling too. I mean, if they um, need that um, as well, but that, that, that's a human and they have a loss and it needs to be acknowledged and people don't move on quite so quickly after, after a loss like that. So a lots of support and you have to be, I don't know, very, very astute to try and figure out what went wrong, whether it was something that we could prevent like an incompetent cervix, you know, and we can do a surplage for the next pregnancy. If there was something genetic, do we, do we have some preconceptual counseling and some genetic testing that needs to be done? If there was an infection, do we treat? So trying to get those answers and the placentas can be very helpful. Um, so a lot of people will save placentas and look at that for pathology as well. Um, but uh, that's a very good question. And I think it's on the forefront of a lot of people's minds, particularly since one out of four probably experiences uh, some type of pregnancy related loss. Thank you. I think this that information is uh, is extremely helpful. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, what about women who adopt infants or become new mothers uh, through surrogacy? What specific specific challenges do they face, Dr. Bacaro? Yes. Thanks, Patty. Yeah, I think these women still share a lot of similarities to um, women that give birth themselves. They're still 100% consumed with baby care. They're still sleep deprived. Um, and the special challenges, though, are going to be, you know, how they try to bond with their new baby. It might not be as um, intuitive um, as, as a mom that delivers her own child. They may not feel as connected with other typical support groups like the breastfeeding moms group, for instance, because they're not breastfeeding. So they might have some of these, you know, unique challenges, but the sleep deprivation is still um, ubiquitous to, to all new moms. Um, another source of stress might be if the adoption was an open adoption, potentially the biological mom wanting to stay in contact, this can be a special sort of stress. Um, and although it's to a lesser degree, we still have to realize that um, these moms still are at risk for postpartum depression. In fact, that can occur in up to 8% of women who an adopt an infant. Again, sometimes it's the sleep deprivation, isolation, um, bonding issues, et cetera. So we just have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, so I, I think many of you on this panel know that I'm a mother of four and I have 14 grandchildren. So I'm going to ask a, for each of you to share a little bit about the fourth trimester and what kind of advice, and maybe it might be personal, a personal story that you might have to help others that are out there listening today. Um, I can start or somebody else wants to start. You start, Patty. Um, if I was talking to my younger self, I would have said, don't be so hard on yourself, you know, and ask for help. I've always had an issue with asking for help. Like I can do everything. I, I'm, I can do anything. And um, I think I really wished when I was having trouble or if I needed to, you know, have a nap or you know, if I was tired and I wasn't feeling well, I didn't ask for somebody to take care of my baby. Um, I think asking and making sure that you have people that you can check in with. And don't, I guess my message would be, don't be so tough on yourself. Uh, and, and also know that you're not perfect. And if you need help, ask for it. I'll go next. <laughs> I believe that's true, Patty. 
And um, I think a piece of advice that I would say is if the father of the baby is involved, get him involved. <laughs> Buddy story. My babies were premature, both of them. So um, I had to, I breastfed, but uh, also supplemented. And then, um, you know, my husband would bring the baby to me or whatever. And it, and I thought he felt a little left out. <laughs> so he had devised a way of doing the football hold and doing the bottle, pretending it was like a nipple. <laughs> Pretending like he was doing it as if you were breastfeeding. He was super cute. I'll, I'll never forget he did with both of the of both of my children. So uh, get you know get the uh, co-parenting person involved if at all possible. Um, the other thing that I said I think is that it's okay if the baby's crying. You're not a bad mom if you let the baby cry. I um, had a book. I can't. I think it was Dr. Weissbluth. It was, I kept reading it, Healthy Sleeping Habits, Happy Child. And it was literally about letting the baby cry this health soothe to a certain degree. And every time, I'm, every single time my mom would call me, that baby would be crying, <laughs> my mom. And then my mother-in-law both were like, Cheryl, throw that darn book away. <laughs> now it's okay to let the baby cry too. Absolutely. And boy, doesn't mother and mother-in-laws have a lot to say about what we do. <laughs> I, I can only trust, listen trust, to the tales my would tell. Since both of them were both stay-at-home moms, you know, trust and believe. <laughs> yes, I have that too. Um, Dr. Vaccaro. Oh, I, I love that you added this question here, Patty, and I loved your advice as well as Dr. Glacia's. Um, mine, I think the, the my favorite part of the fourth trimester was breastfeeding. I loved this part. I thought it was such a beautiful bonding experience uh, for both my children. And although I did have to return to work within that fourth trimester, um, just as Dr. Glacey already mentioned, the breast pumps are so easily transportable now, um, hands-free pumps, et cetera. I think that um, even though I had a demanding schedule, I was able to work it into my day. And I think, unfortunately, some women think, oh, I, I'm not gonna be able, and this is of course after the fourth trimester, I'm not gonna be able to continue breastfeeding because of my demanding schedule might be passed over for promotion or advancements or whatnot. But I would say most employers, if you have the conversation, will support breastfeeding and have adequate space to do that. I would encourage women to have the conversation with their employers early when you're pregnant so that you have a plan when you return to work about you know where you're going to do it and have the resources um, available for you. The other thing that was already mentioned is support. I mean, I... Um, also don't like asking for help, but I realized in this time it was imperative to ask for help. So asking help from your partner and your family, you don't need to be the one doing all the household chores, grocery shopping, cleaning, cooking, et cetera. Take as much time just for yourself and the baby as you can and try to, to allow others to help you um, with those other aspects. Um, if you have the resources, I had excellent au pairs. We still have an au pair actually. Um, for my children. So even, you know, that you have help for, for the child as well. So if you have those resources, that was, was very helpful, at least for me. And then try to take the best care of yourself that you can. So trying to eat well, um, trying to get some sort of outdoor activity, like walking, walking your baby on the stroller, trying to get outside and get some movement, and then getting as much sleep as possible. It was already mentioned. I mean, if your baby's napping, you should be napping. Um, the laundry will wait. Other chores will wait. Try to sleep as much as you can. Again, that's so helpful too to prevent other things like we talked about, the blues and depression. So th those are my tips. Dr. Kathleen? Um, well, my big advice would be um, prepare before delivery. You know, we do all this preparation. We have showers that get you all the things you need to, you know, to take care of your baby. But the most important resource for your baby is you. <laughs> and you need to think ahead and get those support things in place ahead of time. Plan it. it you're going to need it. Um, you know, for my daughter, she is a, a new mom in July and, um, for her shower, instead of me giving her, um, baby things that she wanted, I gave her vaginal at ice packs and heat packs and sits baths and, <laughs> and support garments and, <laughs> 
in um, you know, oil for for her nipples so that they wouldn't, you know, get chapped and um, you know, and those are the things that um, you know, I think as as women, we really need to start, you know, helping to guide our children to think that way, you know, that those that that shower isn't all about just getting things that you think the baby needs, you know. The mom is the most important resource. So let's get the mom what they need, you know, to take care of the baby. And, um, you know, start, start your planning ahead of time because you're going to need that support. Love that. Um, it takes a village, right? It takes a village. Um, is, does anybody else want to add anything to I this? One more thing is like planning for the next pregnancy. We generally like you to wait inter-pregnancies, um, you know, we have those, whatever, whatever they call them, Irish twins or whatever, people who are deliver within uh, 12 months of another delivery. The, the optimal is to wait at least 18 months, you know, between deliveries. So talking about family planning, um, contraception, whatever works for you, that's most effective. That's another important thing to talk about during the um, fourth trimester. Good. I think this has all been unbelievable information. And I want to really thank our guests, Dr. Christine Vaccaro, Dr. Cheryl Iglesias, and Dr. Kathleen Novicki for this amazing conversation. For more information on the Patty Brisbane Foundation for Women's Sexual Health and our six focus areas, visit the Patty Brisbane Foundation.org. Remember, sex care is self-care and sexual health matters.